Uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 6, contains a series of five controversies that uh, Jesus has with the religious leaders. This series of controversies culminates with their decision to destroy or to kill Jesus. But I guess they may not be knowledgeable enough to know how they're going to do that or, or desire it enough to, to start right away. But, uh, but the, the seri- the, it, it continues later in chapter 3 and in chapter 7 and in chapter 8 and in chapter 9 and in chapter 10 as well. And these controversies resumed with a vengeance after Jesus cleanses the temple. His opponents begin to look for a way to destroy or kill him right away. They don't want to give him the opportunity to do anything else, to say anything else. Beginning in Mark chapter 11, verse 27, and all through Mark chapter 12, Mark describes the continuing controversy. Now, if you're keeping track, that would be seven or eight, some would say, specific controversies that Jesus has with the religious leaders in these two chapters. And they all occur on Tuesday of what we would call the Passion Week. Let's begin by reading Mark chapter 11, verses 27 through 33. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you a question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. This brings up what we might call the authority controversy. The authority controversy, two questions of the leaders. They have two questions for Jesus. They're they're important questions and they want them answered right away. Number one is, by what authority are you doing these things? And... Who gave you the authority to do them? These two questions are interrelated. So much so that many translations actually phrase them as one question. They have, uh, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you the authority to do them? So that's just really one question, but two parts to it. Either way, it's really two questions. And these questions stem from Jesus's, well shall we say, presumptive, quote-unquote, presumptive act the day before. What presumptive act might that be? His cleansing of the temple. The effects of his actions the day before may actually still even be visible as he's going through the next day, the temple on the next day. So they ask these two questions of Jesus. And Jesus, as he is known to do, Uh, answers a question with a question. He has one question, single question. All he got, and and before he asks this question, he makes a deal with them. He says, I tell you what, you answer my question and I'll answer yours. I mean, what what could be more fair than that? It's prefaced by that promise. If you answer, I'll tell you. Pretty fair. Some would say, well, no, it's not because they asked their question first, so therefore it should be answered before Jesus. No, doesn't matter. See, they they don't think that Jesus can ask them a question that they can't answer. They're so confident that that, that, that he can't say, yeah, sure, no problem. We'll we'll, we'll answer your question, and then you tell us what authority are you doing these things and who gave you the authority to do them. But Jesus' question is carefully calculated to do two things. The first thing it's carefully calculated to do is it is carefully calculated to indirectly answer their question. Not directly answer it, but sort of indirectly answer it. 
And the second thing it's carefully calculated to do is to embarrass them before the people. See, they're trying to embarrass Jesus. And so Jesus says, hey, two can play that game, we might say. And so the question that Jesus asks is, what was the source of authority for the baptism of John? That's what he means when he says, did the, the baptism of John, did it come from heaven or from man? See, that, those are really the only two options. Either it was from heaven or it was something John made up himself and it's from man. But you know, neither of these choices would work out well for the religious leaders. Because you see, if they say that John's baptism was from heaven, well, they, they nail it. I mean, Jesus would say, why didn't you believe him? But there's more to it than that. Because you see, John had testified concerning Jesus. And so if John's baptism and his ministry, if you will, was from heaven and he had testified about Jesus, then where did Jesus get his authority? Where's Jesus from? He's from heaven as well. So they would have, th that would have been the proper answer. That would have been the right answer. But they can't do that. Because that would have uh, caused them some problems, we might say. But... If they say, well, John's baptism was from man, well, then they were afraid of the people. Since John's status as a prophet was uh, sent by God was widely accepted among the people. So it's two choices they can give on to this, this answer. They come up with the third. Okay, I, I, was, I was sometimes, well not always, I like to do that sometimes on a multiple choice test and the, you know, the teacher gives you the test and it has a set number of answers and you don't like e any of them so you write your own in, you know, sort of thing. I, I, I was going to get it wrong anyway so why not have some fun, right? So anyway, uh, they, they come up with a third option. It's the brilliant option. I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, we, we don't know. And, and Jesus says, okay. And he declines to answer their question directly anyway. See, indirectly he has answered their question because John's baptism was from God and so therefore Jesus gets his authority from God. Well, Jesus then proceeds to counterattack them with a parable directed at the religious leaders. The parable Jesus tells is built from elements found in a parable that Isaiah told in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, which I'm fairly sure the religious leaders would have noted. Um, the parable in Isaiah 5 deals with the, uh, the, the, the country of Judah being taken into captivity, being judged by God in that way. Um, but the parable that Jesus tells here in Mark 12, 1 through 12, has a lot of the similar elements. Uh, there's a vineyard, a, a fence or a wall, a, a wine press, a watchtower, and a forthcoming judgment. But the story and the meaning of the elements in the story differ significantly. If you want to read Isaiah 5, 1 through 7 this afternoon, you'll see how they are, they're, they're similar in, in, in elements and things and in outcome, somewhat, uh, but, the, but anyway, let's, let's turn our attention, though, to what we might call the vineyard controversy. Mark 12, verses 1 through 12. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the winepress and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so on with many others, some they beat and some they killed. And he had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? 
He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And when they were seeking to arrest him, and they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the par- this parable against them, so they left him and went away. This was a common arrangement in Palestine in the first century. Very common arrangement. A, a wealthy landowner would lease their land to, the, to, to some tenants. He might go on a journey. He might be staying in, in the country, uh, but he might be going out of the country. Didn't really matter. He would, he would lease the land to tenants, and it was sort of a sharecropping agreement, an arrangement. Uh, the owner would receive a share of the crop as payment for the tenants using the land. Once the owner of the land had collected his part of the crop, the rest of the crop was given to the uh, tenants to do with what they needed to do, whether it was feed their family or sell it uh, to to gain money to get their family things, uh, however they wanted to use it. Now, in Jesus' parable, it's important to know what the various elements represent. The owner, of course, represents God. The vineyard is uh, God's people. The tenants uh, represent the religious leaders. And the servants that were sent by the owner represent the prophets. Now this may even include up to John the Baptist as a prophet of God, sort of tying it in with the previous uh, discussion about authority. But then there's a special character in this story. The Son. The Son, of course, is, is Jesus. He's not a servant like the prophets that had come before Him. But by portraying Himself as the beloved Son, Jesus shows His unique relationship to God. Without just coming right out and saying, I am the the beloved Son of God, he lets them know by this representation that he has a special relationship to God. But what are the points that are made in the parable? What's so, so important and so significant here about this parable? Well, the religious leaders wanted to keep control of the vineyard for themselves. They didn't want to lose it to anybody. Not even to the son of the owner of the vineyard. Remember, the vineyard is God's people. The religious leaders had control, had authority over them, and they had completely misused the authority that God had given them as leaders. But they liked being in control. Even though they were in control of a sinking ship, we might say, they wanted to be in control. And that, that's what they liked. And so it's very similar to what Stephen says in Acts 7, 51 through 53, that kind of gets, well, gets him stoned um, uh, and, and killed, and he becomes the first Christian martyr. But it's, he says, You stiff necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Sort of what Jesus is saying here. You may be the leaders of the people of God, but you haven't respected God. You haven't followed God. You haven't done what God wanted you to do. And so, the second point is that the religious leaders were to judge themselves. See, that's the point of the question that Jesus asks and then answers. When he says, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He doesn't give them a chance to answer and say, well, the owner's going to come back and say, oh, okay, I understand. I'll give you one more chance. No. The owner of the vineyard is going to come back and he will come and destroy or kill the tenants and give the vineyard to others. See, God was going to take their authority away and give it to somebody else. 
Their authority over the people of God was going to be removed from them and given to somebody else. Perhaps Jesus is referencing here, maybe, the forthcoming leaders of the church. And so the religious leaders were to judge themselves. Third, the religious leaders were rejecting the cornerstone. Verses 11 and 12 are taken from Psalm 118, uh, verses 22 and 23. It's sort of the same parable or, or, or story. Uh, the, a building takes the place of the vineyard. The builders take the place of the ten tenants, the religious leaders. The cornerstone takes the place of the sun, which of course is Jesus. And the builders, the, ten the tenants, the religious leaders, rejected the sun. But do you notice what he says here? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. <laughs> Doesn't matter if they like it or not. Doesn't matter if they accept it or not. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundation upon which the, the, the God's people are built. And you know, odd as it may seem, the religious leaders get the point. <laughs> Most parables that Jesus tells are intended to be a little bit mysterious to the people he directs them at. He would tell them a parable, the people a parable, and then he would explain it to his disciples when they were alone. But on this occasion, Jesus tells this parable to the religious leaders for them to understand, and they get it. They understand, and they want to get him or get rid of him. But they don't want to do it with the crowd around because the crowd is kind of liking what Jesus is saying. And so they leave Jesus. But they're not exactly done with Jesus. The chief priests, scribes, and elders had probably been embarrassed enough for one day by Jesus. So later in that day, they sent some representatives to question Jesus. They didn't come as a big group. They just sent a few of them to him to, to question him. And they have a question that there is absolutely, positively, no possible way that Jesus can give an answer that is going to work out well for him. In fact, whatever answer he gives is going to end up hurting him. This, of course, is talking about the taxing controversy. Verses 13 through 17 of Mark chapter 12. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. You know, this time of the year, I really wish he'd given a different answer. Don't you? I wish he had said, no, don't pay him. That would be great. You know, I mean, you know, we did okay federally speaking this year, but the state, man, state's tough. You know? uh, but anyway, that's another story. I digress, I guess. Uh, anyway, the, tra the trap is set. The trap is this. You see, if Jesus says yes, then the people are not going to like it. If he says, yes, you should pay taxes, the people who maybe saw paying taxes to the Roman government as oppressive and as, as, a, as, as bad and so forth, if he says yes, then he's going to um, alienate many, if not most, of his followers. And so that, that, that would accomplish what the religious leaders wanted. I mean, he wouldn't be nearly as popular. People wouldn't be following around him around, hanging on his every word. And then, if there weren't as many people around, 
then maybe they could carry out their other plans for Jesus. But if Jesus says no, if he says, no, you should not pay taxes to Caesar, well, the Romans aren't going to like that. And that would create a conflict with the uh, Ro Roman authorities. And we all know what that means. They didn't care if they offended some of the Jewish people. This guy said, don't pay taxes. He's going to be eliminated. And the religious leaders get what they want. It's that simple. It's that easy. It's a no-win situation for Jesus. But you know the irony of it all? I mean, it's so, so ironic. The opponents of Jesus address him as teacher, and they praise his integrity, <laughs> neither of which they believed in for a moment. They are lying not just through their teeth. They're lying with wide open mouths here. In 11, 32, and 33, they would not answer his question about John's baptism because they were afraid of the people if they gave the answer that they wanted to give to the question. And then in chapter 12, verse 12, again, they're afraid of the crowds. Yet they praise Jesus for teaching the truth without regard to public opinion. So they teach the quote-unquote truth with regard to public opinion. They don't want to upset the masses. But Jesus doesn't care. He'll, he'll say what is true, whether it upsets the masses or it doesn't upset them. So the trap is set. But then the trap is sprung. <laughs> Jesus' integrity contrasts with their hypocrisy. You know, he, he knew their intent. In fact, he always has. I mean, you look back at chapter 2, verse 8, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5, other passages where there's conflict or controversy with the religious leaders. He knew what they were trying to do. But on this occasion, he actually verbalizes it. He says, why are you trying to trap me? Why are you trying to trick me? Why are you trying to, 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 to do this? He openly declares it in his response. And then about his response, his ingenious response leaves them speechless. <laughs> That's hard to do with these religious leaders, don't you think? But he calls on them to produce a silver denarius. That would be the coin used to pay these taxes and so forth. The coin's inscription showed that it was issued by and thus belonged to the emperor. Thus, the emperor could ask for it. But then he turns the tables a little bit and he calls on them not just to get, produce that denarius, but also he calls on them to count their blessings, all of which were given by God. Thus we should give to God the things that are God's. Three controversies. Three victories for Jesus. Now you'd think, I'd think, that the religious leaders would have had enough. <laughs> you would think that they would cry uncle and go look for a different way to, to destroy Jesus, you know, other than in the arena of public debate, because in the battle of wits, they have been totally outclassed by Jesus. But before Jesus will leave the temple on Tuesday... There will be another four, some would say five, controversies, conflicts with the religious leaders. And if in these first three, Jesus got the best of them, guess who gets the best of them in the next four slash five? Of course, Jesus does. Why? Because Jesus has that much authority. He has that much power. He has that much knowledge. He knows what we're doing. He knows why we're doing it. He wants us to do those things which are pleasing to God. The first and best thing that you can do that's pleasing to God is to give your life to Him. 
You give your life to Him by publicly confessing that you want Jesus to be your Lord and being immersed in the watery grave of baptism, having your sins washed away. If you haven't done that, why haven't you done that? If you haven't done that, why won't you do that this morning? Maybe you did that. But since that time, self has been gaining more and more authority in your life rather than allowing Jesus to have all authority, which he does, Matthew 28 tells us. You need to give him his authority back. Maybe that's done by a private prayer. Maybe it needs to be done by a public response, asking this collect, uh, assembled body to pray with you and to pray for you. Whatever that situation is, if making things right between you and God requires a public response, then won't you come to the front now as we stand and sing together?